Um, I'm Lucy Herman. I'm the program director and a lecturer at Stanford Law School. Uh, this is a quarterly special speaker series. Uh, this is featuring Nate personally to kick us off for the year. Um, we are just really thrilled to get to learn about the redistricting, the Stanford redistricting project. Um, so Hava Levine is joining us as the Stanford project director. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. Before we start, I just want to feature one other um, part of our speaker series, which is a policy career series. And on Monday um, at uh, one o'clock, so Monday, November 1st, can you believe it? Um, we are hosting the first in that series. This is a two year series um, because we had so many people we wanted to bring and introduce to you. Um, and so this will be focusing on nonprofits. And so people who are really engaged um, as leaders in the nonprofit world, social impact world. Uh, so come it's a very free flowing conversation with four SLS alumni and we welcome your questions, um, bring your lunches. Um, it's a Zoom webinar again, so there won't be lunch provided, um, but we welcome you to be there and look forward to having you on Monday. Um, I just put the link in the chat. For today, um, just another housekeeping moment, which is we will be using chat for questions. So. If you have questions along the way, and we hope you do, please put them into the chat, which is set so that hosts and panelists can see the questions. And then that will allow us, Zahava in particular, to kind of group the questions and then be the spokesperson who will ask those questions back out towards the end. Um, so she is the, the voice of all of you. And so please, um, please do use it that way. Um, for today, we have Professor Persley, and I will introduce him as um, the James B. McClatchy Professor of Law at Stanford Law School with appointments in political science, communication, and FSI. Um, he comes to us from Columbia, where at Columbia, uh, he worked off of the 2010 data uh, to uh, run a version of this redistricting project there it was i think it was the first of its kind uh, and it was um, represented nationally in the news there is an article that i'm going to post in the chat right now if you're interested in knowing more about it uh, and he brought that project here to us this time for the first time this is the columbia project uh, and we are now um, i think you've got something like 60 people engaged in the project he'll tell us more about that um, it runs through the uh, winter and spring terms as well. And so if you all are interested in joining the project um, going forward after you learn more about it today, um, I'm posting in the chat right now a link to Draw Congress, the Stanford Redistricting Project, which is Law 808I. Uh, and so here is that link. And then we have with us um, really just a the wonderful Zahava Levine, who I've been working with both of these folks um, ever since um, I was privileged to get to be part of the signature verification team, which was a policy lab of a few years ago, and Zahava was part of that leadership team. And then she's been working with Nate ever since, um, doing the Healthy Elections Project last year, now the Stanford Redistricting Project. I have a feeling that you have discovered your new career, Zahava. She came to um, Stanford from um, Google as a Google lawyer, and she was a DCI fellow. Um, and you may know something about DCI fellows, which is that they are at the tops of their careers. Um, they don't necessarily need to have new careers, but many of them are young enough to want to think about like how they can have real impact in the world. And I think Sahava has found her place. So we are thrilled to have her here today. Um, so we will turn it over to Nate right now to take it away. And um, I leave it with you. Well, thank you so much and thanks everybody for joining. I think uh, about half the people who are here are, are already in our class. So uh, you'll, you'll get um, a bit of a review of what we have been doing. But as Lucy said, um, we're running a policy lab uh, called the Stanford Redistricting Project, but it's also, um, you can see our work at drawcongress.org um, uh, because the students have been drawing maps all term and uh, we now have 
maps for the entire country that are up there, but uh, we want more and more. And so that's why we want to get as many students involved in this project. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say this is a one of a kind opportunity. Um, you know, there's there's no other class taught like this in the world, and uh, partly because it's it's expensive, <laughs> we had to buy licenses for everybody uh, to this very expensive software, and also that it's um, uh, not a whole lot of people do this kind of work, but it's incredibly important. And this is the year to uh, to do it because it comes around once a decade, and uh, then like the cicadas, we kind of go back into our you know, hibernation uh, for 10 years. And so if you're interested in redistricting, which is a burgeoning area of the law in all kinds of respects, um, taking this class, if you're if you're here at Stanford, um, would be a good opportunity. Uh, and, uh, you know, you'll actually uh, emerge with a, a real skill on how to draw districts. What I'm gonna talk about today, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a kind of intro to the 2020 redistricting process, but also try to pitch this for many different levels of people who, uh, know something about redistricting, those who don't know anything. Uh, so I'll talk about real quickly the history of redistricting just to kind of level set people's expectations. And then I will um, jump into the contemporary controversies and where things stand and make sure to leave open uh, plenty of time for questions. So I'll talk about for 20 to 30 minutes about uh, this and then um, uh, please throw questions into the into the chat or Q&A and I'll, I'll take a look at those. All right. So I've got a PowerPoint. Um, but let me let me just say by way of introduction that you know, the reason we draw districts every 10 years is because there's a new census, right? Never since the 1950s and 60s, uh, the Supreme Court has said that um, you know one person, one vote requires that when there's a new census that we redraw boundaries. Um, and so uh, ever since then, we've you know been, been uh, drawing uh, equal population districts, uh, but you know, the history of, of redistricting is also the history of gerrymandering. And so now let me share my screen. And um, always a, a challenge here. Um, Can everybody see that screen? I should. I will assume yes, unless uh, someone else tells me. Um, all right, good. So this was the original gerrymander. This is the um, picture of a you know redistricting plan for a particular district in northern Massachusetts that Elbridge Gerry, who is the governor of, Ma of Massachusetts, uh, drew, and the. Um, there were two journalists sitting next to each other looking at this redistricting plan that was drawn. And one said to the other, look, this, this district looks like a salamander. You can see all the little towns that are joined together. Uh, and then the cartoonist said, no, 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 that's not a salamander, that's a gerrymander. And ever since then, uh, the terminology of the gerrymander was born. Uh, and so I, what we, we do in this class and what I do in my work, right, is to uh, think about gerrymandering and redistricting, um, the very, all the different kinds of gerrymanders. If you take my law of democracy class, you learn about classic racial gerrymanders, such as in Gamillion versus Lightfoot, where um, the whites in Alabama would uh, you drew, redrew the district line or the county lines of Tuskegee um, in order to excise African Americans, uh, all but about you know a few dozen African Americans from the city, to create that that yellow uh, district there, uh, you learn about other classic racial gerrymanders where the minority population, African American population in Mississippi, was cracked, and um, uh, in order to prevent them from electing their candidates of choice, um, and so. The, the process of drawing lines, right, is um, open to all kinds of um, different strategies. And so you know, because the, of sort of the political stakes that are involved and the intrigue surrounding redistricting, right, there it's become a bit of a science and an art. Um, and so, it, you know, a lot of what happens in the redistricting process is those who control the pen um, can can exert costs or exact costs on their opponents and reward their supporters. 
They can do this through a series of strategies such as packing, cracking, and stacking, right? Packing is taking your opponents and putting them in, uh, you know, in a district where they're over-concentrated. Cracking is dispersing them among many different districts. Stacking is actually taking multiple districts and then combining them together so that they're one super district that elects multiple representatives. Uh, and those are the, the sort of classic ways that we uh, draw lines in order, you know, if, if you're in charge and you're trying to um, uh, get advantages in the redistricting process. And so there are different types of gerrymanders, partisan gerrymanders you're probably familiar with, right, where uh, one party cracks and packs its opponents in order to gain advantage in the redistricting process. Bipartisan gerrymanders where the Democrats and Republicans will divide up a state into safe districts. Uh, so there's not a whole lot of competition in those areas. So you have pure Democratic districts, pure Republican districts, or at least uncompetitive ones. Incumbent protecting gerrymanders can often be the same as a bipartisan gerrymander, but it usually means that the incumbents get safe districts for themselves. Uh, sometimes an incumbent, more than anything, wants to keep the district that they've run from before. Um, I've drawn plans where we drew what seemed to be safe districts, um, uh, but the incumbents didn't like them because it uh, took them out of their familiar territory and put them into uh, you know, equally partisan, but uh, safe territory that they were unfamiliar with. And then you know, part of what we try to do in this new project is to think about nonpartisan criteria. And in the last 20 years, there's been a resurgence or a, a growth in um, independent commissions that are that are drawing lines. And usually they come up with good government criteria like compactness, contiguity, respect for political subdivision lines, uh, respecting communities of interest, which is a slippery concept inherently, but um, there's been a lot of, I think, work on that in the last uh, decade. Um, and communities of interest can be, you know, any groups de de um, defined by culture, um, economics, religion, and the like. Um, there's some places like Arizona that actually requires the construction of um, competitive districts. Um, and others like Utah, where I'm, I'm one of the advisors, and Maryland, where I'm also where I'm just finishing a plan, actually, um, where they uh, say that you may not favor or disfavor a political party, which is what the Utah law says. Um, and so there are different political kind of considerations. One, on our website, if you go to drawcongress.org, you'll see different kinds of plans, that, some that we call good government plans, which are responsive to these kinds of considerations, and others, which are least change plans, um, where you just try to adjust the existing districts in order to um, keep the, the make, make sure they comply with one person, one vote. Um, but now, of course, a least change plan could be just replicating a gerrymander if what you do is uh, if the original gerrymander is there and then you end up uh, drawing it, uh, it with a least change principle in mind. Um, final thing that you have to sort of think about just as lawyers is what happens if you do nothing? Um, and the answer is uh, it goes to court. And wh which court is an important question? Does it go to the state court? Does it go to federal court? There's often a race to the courthouse. And, um, and so at, you're seeing around the country as a lot of these commissions fall apart, um, because Democrats and Republicans cannot agree on maps, that then it goes as it does right now in Virginia, goes to the state Supreme Court in that case. And so as the parties bargain uh, to think about the redistricting process um, and, and what they can get out of it, um, they're always thinking about, well, can I, is the other party offering me a better or worse deal than I think would happen if the courts got involved? And so we should start seeing the courts in the next month or through December, starting to get much more actively involved. And I'll talk a little bit about the time crunch that's inevitably uh, happened this time because of the late census data. Um, so let me just show you like some of the problems that, that as you think about those strategies, what, how difficult it is uh, to draw districts that accurately represent communities. This is Atlanta when I, I was appointed to do the redistricting uh, 20 years ago there uh, in, in, in Georgia. And so you could, this is the African-American population in deep green. Um, and if you draw districts that are, you know, sort of right in the city of, of Atlanta, uh, Fulton DeKalb County, you'll end up drawing these 80, 90% African-American districts. Um, and this is not an unfamiliar uh, problem, but if you draw them, you know, you can crack. And, and if, you, if you draw them out into the 
um, suburbs, the largely white suburbs, right? You can create these sort of 30% African American districts, and uh, you know, the, the sort of a Goldilocks principle of redistricting. What is the uh, best way in order to um, uh, represent communities to to make sure they get an effective uh, voice in the process? Um, and it's and it's quite difficult. And that's one of the things that we think about a lot in our in our project or in my courses, which is well. You know what is the how how should districts be drawn uh, in order to make sure that there's accurate representation of communities, recognizing that you know there's no um, there's no right way to redistrict, right? There are a lot of wrong ways, but but uh, redistricting is about trade-offs and thinking about the different principles that should be um, uh, applied in a given context, recognizing that there will be some losers and some winners no matter what you do. So uh, what are the inputs? What, are, what kind of data do we play with in our project as well as uh, just in the real world redistricting process? So the, the, the backbone of uh, redistricting is the census. And so there is a lot of controversy in the 2020 census. In fact, a lot, of, and I'll talk a little bit about this later, we're specifically talking about 2021, um, but there's, there's this special data file called the PL94171 data file, which gives you population um, and voting age population broken down by race and ethnicity, ethnicity being whether you're Hispanic or not, and then um, race, there's six uh, main racial groups. Uh, and that's, that's the key you know, to the redistricting process is having um, uh, the census data. Uh, and we got it about four or five, six months late this time. Um, um, and so it's, it's put quite a crunch on the redistricting process. But th that's just tells you how many people live where. Um, as you draw districts, there's all kinds of other considerations that you sort of think of beyond just um, the number of people, whether it's the political subdivision lines like lines of cities and counties, or the existing districts, as I said before, if it's a least change plan, or topographical features like mountains and rivers and how you might want to follow them to, to kind of give predictability uh, to lines, highways, railroads. Uh, like I just spent a lot of time last night trying to figure out how to draw the districts consistent where the major roads were in Baltimore, for example. Um, and then if you're a political party or if you're, try, if you're trying to either draw fair maps or you're trying to draw biased maps, you need to know about how the political performance of a particular area so that um, you can figure out you know, what, what, the, what the likely outcome is by political party. So um, the most sophisticated actors are, uh, will, be, will have models from you know, based off of election returns. Uh, and you break them down. You get that, of course, at the precinct level, and then you try to break them down further to the census block with some predictive modeling. Um, party registration data you have, of course, the locations of incumbents' residences. When I first did redistricting in New York on their redistricting program, they actually, uh, if you move the line over an incumbent's house, a bell would go off to warn you that you were uh, drawing districts that would maybe threaten that incumbent, right? It gives you a sense of what happens when incumbents draw their lines. Um, political data, we've come a long way in, in democratizing political data. And if you go, we, we, in, we have access to it in, the, in our um, uh, project, but also if you go to Dave's redistricting app or some of these other um, popular um, platforms like PlanScore, which we use, they evaluate uh, plans for dem you know, Democratic and Republican bias or levels of comp competitiveness and the like. So uh, what about uh, community interest data? So different, you know, different groups will provide different uh, uh, data. I'm, I'm currently, it was fascinating hearing that I was a part of the other day since I'm the advisor of the Maryland Commission where the Jewish community of Northwestern Baltimore said that they were being cracked by the plan. And so they showed us Here's where the Jewish community lives. And if you're familiar with like Orthodox Judaism, they showed on a map something called the Eru, which is like a, a boundary line that um, uh, identifies the, the confines of the Jewish community there because it's significant for whether you can carry something on the Sabbath and the like. And, uh, and so that's an example of a community of interest, right? Um, to identify the location of uh, the Jewish community in Northwest Baltimore. But whether it's industries or associations or socioeconomic characteristics, uh, other kind of testimony that you get in these redistricting hearings, they can all kind of fill out the picture of uh, where the communities live. 
Now, I'll say one thing about communities of interest. We assume that communities want to be kept whole in the redistricting process, but that's not always the case. Um, sometimes there's communities that want to be split because they think that um, their, their power will be uh, increased if they're in more than one district. So let's just talk quickly about the law since this is, the, this is a law school presentation, uh, and then we can um, talk a little bit about the 2021 redistricting process. So, so the basic rules are um, from the constitution are prohibition on malapportionment, which is one person, one vote. The districts need to be roughly equal for um, state legislature and, and non-congressional districts. But as you'll see when you go to our website for congressional districts, most of our plans are plus or minus one person. Right now, of course, the census data is not that accurate, but these are the students have suffered uh, overnight trying to make their plans really almost perfectly equal um, um, because that's the way of insulating them from any one person, one vote uh, challenge. Even though the, the Supreme Court has made clear you don't have to be perfectly equal, uh, you just have to be able to justify the deviations. One way to be really safe is to make them perfectly equal. In addition to that, requirement, you can't uh, intentionally discriminate on the basis of race, nor can you uh, draw districts with race as the predominant factor with a particular um, exception to that. And so some of the strangely shaped districts that were drawn in the, in the 1990s were struck down as what we call impermissible Shaw violations, uh, where the Shaw versus Reno is the case that said, you may not draw a district predominantly based on race unless, unless, um, it's narrowly tailored to avoid a violation of the Voting Rights Act. Um, until a few years ago, we thought that there might be a cause of action for partisan gerrymandering, but no longer in the Rucho case, the Supreme Court basically said they are not gonna strike down uh, partisan uh, gerrymandering. Um, then um, on the Voting Rights Act, uh, you may be aware that section five was struck down. Um, um, that was required pre-clearance of plans with the federal government, so uh, that's no longer, but section two is still alive and well and will be a ripe source of litigation this cycle. That's the provision that basically says that you, you a minority group can sue um, uh, if it's large enough and compact enough to constitute a single member district and lives in an area where there's a lot of racial polarization. And so um, um, we will start seeing those suits uh, once these plans come out, uh, actually we've already started to see some of them uh, to say that a redistricting plan has a discriminatory effect. Finally, you can't forget all the state law claims. There are different states that have different requirements on compactness, contiguity, respect for political subdivisions. We should expect some of those, that litigation in 2021 as well. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, places like Arizona have a competitiveness uh, requirement. Some other states have partisan fairness. So what about the 2021 uh, redistricting process? What's changed? Well, so there, there are the persistent challenges, which is that you know, partisan gerrymandering is still a problem. In many ways, it may be even a bigger problem now than previously, um, just because the future of the House of Representatives and who controls it is at stake. Um, and uh, one thing we're seeing is quite a lot of, of uh, incumbent protection to make sure that incumbents are not um, at, at risk. Um, still the problems and, and concerns about racial discrimination and vote dilution. Although I'll say that one of the challenges now is to distinguish between race and party in these, in these cases, which is uh, you know, almost you know, conceptually sometimes quite difficult when there's a high correlation between uh, race and party. Um, and you know, we're seeing you know, breaking up of communities of interest. Uh, as I mentioned here, the biases of the single member district system itself um, one of the things you know that that is a critique that you frequently hear is that um, that because Democrats are so packed in uh, cities that even the process of redistricting necessarily is biased against them because they're not going to end up being able to um, you know they're not as efficiently dispersed in the population as Republicans. Depends on the location, what place we're talking about, whether that's true or not. But as a general rule, it's true. So what's, uh, what are the new challenges with the 2020 uh, redistricting cycle? I mentioned the census before, um, but let me, let me emphasize it. So first is that because of COVID and because of some other shenanigans involved in the census dealing with citizenship, um, the census data was only released in August. 
which and usually it's it's released by April or so. Uh, and so that means that we've been at, sort of at a frenzied pace trying to redraw our lines um, for the 2022 elections. Uh, and so that's been quite challenging. Um, that controversy over citizenship, there were, the Trump administration wanted to put a question on the census that asked people about their citizenship. That delayed things, but it's also that controversy about citizenship hasn't gone away, I think, and we should probably see a little more of that uh, coming um, you know, down the pike in the next year or two um, about what, maybe with some states uh, trying to draw districts based on eligible voters as opposed to total population, which is the way when we drive, if you look at the maps that we put together, it's based on total population. Um, other issues with the census that um, um, the census, because they were worried about privacy violations now, has decided to add noise to the census data. And so I talked before about how for one person with vote reasons, you try to draw these districts in a really mathematically equal way. Well, that census has deliberately added error at the block level to um, uh, the census data. Now that's not really that big a problem because we you know, work with the data that you have and it's not gonna be that big a deal when we say craft congressional districts, but it's led to some lawsuits about you know, the fact that the census data are um, intentionally uh, filled with error this time. The truth is there's always been some population swapping that was done by the census um, to protect anonymity um, uh, and privacy in the census, but this time it's at a, at a different level. One thing we've seen in the, in the recent data with the census is a breakdown in the racial categories. So a huge number of people, particularly Latinos actually, but, but larger group than that, checking off some other race on the census form, um, but then also a rise in multiraciality. This is you know, something to celebrate in a lot of ways, but it's also quite difficult if you're trying to think about uh, representation of minority communities and how to accurately do that so that um, you comply with the Voting Rights Act, as well as just to make sure that you're not diluting a particular community's uh, vote. I'll say one other thing here um, on the sense, well, actually this might be more on the opportunities side of things. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell it in a second, but uh, I'll mention about the prisoner allocation in a second. As I said before, the, the partisan issues with this redistricting cycle are about as acute as ever before because of the fact that people think that the future of Congress hangs in the balance, and that's not a crazy assumption given how close things are right now um, and how, you know, the, which parties control different redistricting processes. Um, we, things are different now than they were 10 years ago, though, because we have a large number of states where Democrats control the governorship and Republicans control the legislature, places like uh, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, for example, no, North Carolina also, but the governor in North Carolina doesn't play a role in the redistricting process. Um, and so, whereas 10 years ago, the Republicans pretty much had their way in the redistricting process, it's a little more complicated now. And we should expect in some of those battleground states that there's going to be uh, litigation and the courts might end up drawing it. Um, we don't know what the Supreme Court is going to do in the redistricting realm. As we, as I said before, they, uh, the party, um, the partisan gerrymandering claim is now a federal partisan gerrymandering claim is now defunct. Uh, Supreme Court and Rucho said that partisan gerrymanders are not justiciable. Um, but there's there's still other claims, and we don't know which way that's going to, which way things are going to go. So uh, first thing is Section Two of the Voting Rights Act. Um, uh, how how will this Supreme Court deal with uh, these the basically the mandate that you draw certain majority minority districts uh, when you can, and um, um, you know people like Brett Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett, uh, Neil Gorsuch, those justices have not uh, weighed in on that kind of critical question. Although they did have a Section Two case last year dealing with vote denial in Arizona, and um, um, they adopted a more restrictive interpretation than the Democrats wanted. Uh, and then there's a there's this case I put on the slide here, Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission, which um, held upheld redistricting commissions for Congress, but that held, upheld it by five to four. And the and the person who was the tie-breaking vote, uh, Anthony Kennedy, is no longer on the Supreme Court. And so 
if the Supreme Court is looking for places to uh, flex its muscles, striking down redistricting commissions would be a pretty, when it comes to congressional districting, would be quite a dramatic move, uh, but it, it seems like it's you know, within the realm of possibility. All right, so those are the challenges. What about the new opportunities and developments? Um, so there are more commissions this cycle. Um, I mentioned two of them that I'm involved with now, Utah and Maryland. Um, but there's other places like Colorado. Here in California, we, we've had a commission before. Last time was the first time. Um, but there are commissions and there are commissions. So that, that a com just because you call something a commission doesn't make it bipartisan, doesn't make it uh, nonpartisan. Um, some of these have equal numbers of Republicans and Democrats as happened in Virginia, and then they fell apart. Some of them are advisory, as in um, Maryland and in Utah. Uh, and sort of in New York, which is a complicated structure. Um, and so, so we're real, there's a lot of experimentation in the, in the kind of bodies that are doing redistricting uh, this time. And so where there's a lot of attention being paid to that. I mentioned before the issue of prisoners. So the, the, the thing with um, prisoners is that you know, prisoners, for purposes of the census, prisoners are counted at their pre-incarceration, are counted in prison. Right, so the rule for the census is you're counted where you exist on April 1st of the census year, where and what the rule is where you um, um, sleep and eat most of the time. Right, that's the rule, and so prisoners are in prison. But there are several states, roughly ten of them at this point, I think, that now say that's unfair for redistricting because a lot of the times what happens is you have. Um, disproportionately minority uh, prisoners taken from cities that then are put into rural, largely white areas uh, with predictable racial and partisan bias uh, effects. And, um, and so they've, they've created new data sets to reallocate prisoners to the pre-incarceration address. So Maryland's doing that, Delaware, New York, uh, a whole host of other states uh, are doing it. Some places it, it's significant because there is such a bias. In other cases, it's not as um, significant in terms of whether either party uh, or racial representation. Um, this time, as I mentioned before, there are all these new tools that the public can get involved in. And that's one of the things where, you know, I'd say we're, we're contributing to that. As I, uh, there are new measures of partisan gerrymandering and partisan bias that uh, have been developed in the last decade that are useful for courts as well as commissions. There are new, um, uh, you know, there are computer programs that will allow you to draw millions of maps uh, if you wanted to, uh, in order to get a sense of like what the distribution of potential sort of competitive districts or partisan biases. Uh, plan score is one of those. Um, one of those websites actually developed by a former student of mine who's now a Harvard law professor, Nick Stephanopoulos, and Eric McGee, who's, who's at the California Public Policy Information Center. Um, and that evaluates plans for partisanship, uh, partisan bias and the like. Uh, Nick actually took the, this class at Columbia that um, was the precursor to the one we're teaching now, as well as uh, um, community of interest mapping um, and online public redistricting portals like the ones mentioned there as well as our own drawcongress.org, which you should go and visit. Um, this it was when the map was incomplete. Now it's all dark blue uh, for the areas that need uh, districting plans. And so um, you, can, you can see what the students have drawn there. And if you are a student here at Stanford, you should uh, come join the project. Um, uh, you know, we, we have roughly, um, uh, I don't know, roughly 20 students who are taking it right now. We've had an equal number or so who, who worked on it over the summer. Uh, this is the, the time to do it. Um, uh, if we, you know, if you're interested in redistricting, please, please come and join us uh, in our project uh, next term, uh, where Ben Ginsburg, who led the redistricting efforts for the Republican Party, will be joining as one of the instructors. Uh, and um, uh, Zahava will still be with us uh, in the winter as well. And um, we you know, continue to draw different types of maps using different kinds of principles. Um, and uh, the students will also be writing papers uh, for their states so that they can explain the redistricting plans, which is sometimes not something that you get when the incumbents of the political parties uh, draw the lines. So it's an exciting time to do this. It's nerve wracking and exhausting as well. 
Um, but uh, one of the one of the great things about our class is that I can come in and talk about war stories about what's actually happening in the real world uh, as I get involved. And so with that, why don't I open it up for questions if there are any um, and um, turn it, I guess, over to Zahava. You need to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Hello, thank you. Great presentation. Yes, um, let me open the question and answer section by asking, I wanna ask a series of questions about potential public policy solutions, if any, to partisan gerrymandering um, and the best way to accomplish that. Just to frame the question and to repeat some of what you said, right? There've been various attempts to address partisan gerrymandering. Uh, judicially, there's been some success under state law and state constitutions, um, but the Supreme Court, as you pointed out, and in Rucho decided that partisan gerrymandering is non-justiciable under federal law. Uh, there is some federal pending federal legislation. We have the For the People Act, known as HR1, um, which would expressly ban partisan gerrymandering for congressional districts, um, among many other voting reforms in HR1. And that was passed by the, the House, but not the Senate. We also have the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, which was also passed by the House and not the Senate, which would effectively reinstate the preclearance requirement of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, um, which, as you said, requires you know, covered states to get preclearance from the DOJ or, or, or a court um, prior to the enactment of a voting law to ensure that it doesn't have a discriminatory purpose or effect. Now, the law doesn't ban partisan gerrymandering, but it would require preclearance for future gerrymanders that, that would make minority groups worse off relative to the the prior districting scheme. And then we also, as you pointed out, we still have section two of the BRA and we don't know how that's gonna be interpreted. So my questions for you, that's just a lot of background to a three, three phase question. What, number one, what in your view is the appropriate public policy response to extreme partisan gerrymandering, if any? Two, what is your view on the federal legislation that I summarized and which of these acts would be most effective or, and do any of them have any chance of passing? And three, if either of the two pending pieces of legislation did pass, is it, would they be likely to survive judicial scrutiny or are there grounds on which the currently conservative uh, Supreme Court might strike it down? Okay, good. So first, let's let's deal with the meta question. Although I guess now the word meta has been expropriated by folks in Silicon Valley uh, <laughs> yesterday. But but so what, what you know? What should we do? How can you do this the right way? So like I said, there's no right way to redistrict, but there are a lot of wrong ways. And so can we put legal constraints on the process in order to um, um, try to deal with the extreme tales of the distribution? And so there are two kind of I'd say approaches to dealing. Well there are three kinds of approaches. And um, often when I'm asked about commissions and doing, doing work uh, or constructing commissions, I'll say that you have to focus on the people, the um, principles and the policies, right? And so the people, who's going to staff some kind of organization like this? Um, what are the principles that are gonna guide redistricting? And then what's the process, right? And so, you know, the, the, the worst situation, right, is you have, you know, uh, hard nosed, hard nosed, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, uh, dedicated partisans who um, are, uh, you know, trying to seek partisan advantage solely and lock out everyone else from the process, right? So, and that is often the case right now, right? But that is, that is suboptimal. Um, and so how do you construct, what, what, what kind of system would be better in order to, to deal with that? And, and so on the, on the process side, having a more open and participatory system where all you know, folks uh, can be, uh, have their voices heard. If you look what California is doing, that, that they're holding hearings all around the state. It's really quite open. Um, the way they tried to deal with the people problem is they have equal numbers of Democrats, Republicans, and independents. Um, you can, now you can ask whether in place like California is so disproportionately Democrat, is that the right mix? You know, but that is, um, you know, at least it's not one party that's ramming down the preferences uh, to the out party. Um, 
And and so then and then what are the principles? And that's where the, the legislation comes in as well as sort of thinking about it. And there's two, I think, kind of modalities of principles. Like, do you just try to think about nonpartisan criteria and then uh, instill that in the process, right? And, and say, just focus on these issues. Or do you, you expressly um, admit that there is a, uh, you know, partisan, some they're going to be partisan winners and losers, and so let's look at partisan criteria and partisan data in order to draw fair maps. So, so one approach that often, when I'm appointed by courts, this is the way that they tell me to behave, is just draw districts based on you know, that are compact according to certain mathematical measures, respect political subdivision lines, uh, and um, are equal population, you know, complying with the law. Now. That sounds good, and I draw on really pretty maps. And if you're interested, I think we'll be posting the map for Congress. For I think it's up there now. If you go to the Maryland Risk Redistricting site, you can see what is like a artistically quite beautiful map. Um, but just because something's pretty doesn't mean that it's necessarily the right way to draw lines. Um, and it really sort of depends on what you're there. There are sometimes, as I said before, biases in the principles. So that if you draw a compact district based on political subdivision lines, it may systematically bias against Democrats, for example. And so then um, what happens if you allow partisan data to be part of the process? What does that mean? Um, how should you incorporate it? And so like the Arizona Redistricting Commission just today released its draft maps and they have a mandate in their law that requires them to draw competitive districts. And the only way you can draw competitive districts is if you have the political data so that you know what the predicted you know, likelihood is of a competitive race. But that's you know, quite fraught in a lot of ways. And, and, and so you can use political data in order to you know, try to draw what you think are fair maps. So if, it's a, you know, if, a, if a state is 50% Republican, 50% Democrat, you could do what I said before, draw a bipartisan gerrymander, where it's, which is sort of based on proportional representation, where half the districts lean Democrat, half the districts lean Republican. You could try use partisan data in order to draw some number of competitive districts as Arizona uh, just did. So um, you, you might say, well, that you, you're gonna have some safe districts for Democrats or Republicans, but you're gonna have enough competitive ones that, um, that, that they will be reflected, that elections will mean something. Right. Um, my own kind of preference, if I was king, right, is uh, although if I'm king, I don't know if we need districts, but but that what what is that you have to develop a kind of portfolio theory of redistricting, right? Which is that you want to have you want you want to have uh, um, um, enough competitive districts so that elections will actually have consequences, so that shifts in voter preferences will be reflected in the composition of the legislature or Congress. But if you have every district be competitive, then you're gonna have wild swings, right? So Democrats, and, and it won't necessarily lead to accurate representation. If you think about it, if every district is 50% Democrat, 50% Republican, then, and there's a 1% swing in voter preferences, then 100% of the districts end up being of one party, right? And so that's not desirable either. Um, and so you wanna have, um, each large interest, however we define it, also that, that can be uh, geographically represented to have some representation. Now, not every interest is going to get as much representation as they want, right? But you wanna make sure that whether it's a partisan group, racial group or, or the like, that there's adequate representation um, reflective of the size of that group, even if it's not kind of perfectly equal to it. Uh, and and that, that is where community of interest considerations come in as well, to make sure that communities um, um, are able to have their voice heard. And so you, you know, this is a kind of mushy totality of the circumstances kind of approach where you, you know, you, you, you have to kind of be thinking about a lot of things as you're drawing districts. But I can tell you that when I, when I do the plans, right, that is what, that is, as you go block by block and starting to, you know, put communities together, you start thinking, well, if I do this here, What's the effect on that particular community? And it's like, well, is it necessary for me to split this community in a particular way for one person, one vote reasons or other reasons? Um, you know, how should we think about that? Generally speaking, when I do it for courts, they prohibit me from looking at partisan data and then it has political consequences, um, but, but sometimes uh, they might be more amenable uh, to the use of that. Now going to the federal legislation that you mentioned before. Um, 
So the, the different bills, as you mentioned, do different things. So the John Lewis Voting Rights Act tries to it not only re, reenact Section 5 of the, the pre-existing Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, which required not just in redistricting, but in with respect to other uh, realms of voting law, to requires covered jurisdictions to get permission from the federal government um, when they uh, enact new voting laws. Um, what's interesting about this version, which differs from the previous Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, is that there's both a geographic coverage formula, which happened before because of the history of the South, um, you know, in discrimination, much of the South was covered with, with Section 5. Um, this, the, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act has a, a different trigger, which um, has to do with um, the number of voting rights violations that a jurisdiction has had in the last uh, 20 years or so. So it doesn't capture all of what I would consider like the bad actors uh, when it comes to voting laws, um, but it's trying to you know, resuscitate what was a quite successful law from the standpoint of minority representation and minority voting rights. Um, so that's good, uh, you know, and it's trying to work within the Supreme Court's um, strictures on this from the Shelby County case. My guess is this Supreme Court might strike it down also, but who knows. One of the good things about the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, though, is it doesn't just focus on, on uh, ge geography. It also has what's called a practice trigger so that certain things like voter ID laws also have to get uh, around the country would have to get permission from the from the Department of Justice or a federal court. There's a lot more to say, of course, about that. Now, what, on the what, what could you just what would on what grounds would this could the Supreme Court strike down uh, either the John Lewis uh, Voting Act or the HR one? So different grounds, right? So so with with the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, it's it's under Shelby County. Does this statute comply? With the rule laid down in Shelby County, which which struck down the previous trigger as being um, basically, out of date. But well, it's, out of, it's not just that it was out of date, but it, it was uh, they don't use these words, but from the other other case law, that it was incongruent and disproportionate to the to the voting rights violations. Right now, look, this is certainly better than the other trigger that pre-existed it in terms of its likelihood of being upheld. Um, but right now, who knows what the Supreme Court thinks about this, right? I mean, maybe they would uphold it, maybe. Um, and that's what the authors of this are hoping for. And I would hope that they would uphold it. But I don't, I don't know. Um, then on HR1, now HR1 has these gerrymandering provisions. HR1 is a gigantic 800-page bill dealing with all kinds of aspects of the um, of the voting process. There's now a Freedom to Vote Act, which was, I think, the Mansion Compromise, which is now out there as well, that the House, I believe, passed, right, and is now um, uh, being considered, though who knows what the likelihood of success there is, because unless you overturn the filibuster, there have been no Republicans who've, who've joined on that bandwagon. Um, and there, the gerrymandering provisions there are are kind of dealing with those people processes and, and, and principles ideas that I had bef mentioned before. Um, and so it, it would require like districts be drawn. Th th there's a kind of preference for commissions that's built into HR1 so that if you draw districts with an authentically nonpartisan or bipartisan commission, that maybe you will be um, likely to have your plan uh, to be seen as legal. Um, uh, if you don't use commissions, then then there's there's a set of strictures about compactness, contiguity, respect for political subdivision lines, not favoring parties, um, um, respect for communities of interest is in there, as well as some other kinds of um, uh, making sure that you comply with the Voting Rights Act, Section Two, and, and and amendments of that. So there's a lot more in there, but that's like the basic idea is that it it's a nonpartisan an attempt to have more nonpartisan bipartisan redistricting. Thank you. I know that was a very big loaded question. I was like, yeah, well, when you have when you have three, you know, a three part question about the state of redistricting law, that's the answer you're going to get. And my, and my next question was going to ask if you were a philosopher king, but you already got to that. So yeah. that great. Um, we had had we've had a couple of questions about what happens to incumbents mm -hmm. when in redistricting, when incumbents lose their districts and particularly in states that actually lose a district. So it's it's inevitable that at least one incumbent uh, would lose their district, but sometimes just the way that lines are redrawn, an incumbent is drawn outside of their district. Um, 
or it's intentionally drawn, right, to assume that they'll lose. Um, there's just some questions about, is there any recourse for incumbents in those cases? Uh, what do, do they, do they move and run again? What's the practice or what's the, is there a custom? So it's a really interesting set of questions. Um, and thank you, Alora, in the chat for put, raising some of them. Um, the, so let, let's start with Congress. The, there is no rule that a member of Congress needs to live in his or her district in order to run from it. And there are examples every redistricting cycle of members of Congress who end up running uh, in a district where they don't live. So that is that is essentially constitutionally the rule um, because you can't add qualifications to office uh, in the constitution. So, um, so you could, you know, in terms of incumbent residence for Congress, it's doesn't it's not legally required that you, uh, you know, live in your district in order to run. But of course, there's some political fallout if you're like running for a district where you're not a resident. It's like, who are you to represent this district, right? Um, and so, so that's you know part of the challenge. And and often, if politicians are drawing the lines, right, they will uh, draw districts in a way that preserve incumbents' residences or Sometimes they'll go after incumbents, right? Well, they will draw draw a line to try to pair incumbents. There's some notable things that are going on in Illinois uh, right now where they're trying to knock out some of the uh, uh, Republican incumbents there. Um, and in doing so, they would join houses of you know different Republican incumbents and put them in the same district. Um, but sometimes it's not just about the residences, it's about like what you do to the district. I mean, sometimes an incumbent would prefer to be out of the district if they can, if they can run in that district for um, an open seat that is fair, uh, that where they're likely to win, uh, as opposed to you could take someone's residence and put it into very unfriendly territory and then they might end up resigning. Um, for Now for state legislative uh, districts, it is not, uh, they're, they're potentially different rules. I say potentially because each state is a little bit different on this. And so some of them have a residency requirement that say you have to live in your district six to 12 months before you can run from it. And so if you're in a, um, you know, if you if it's a redistricting year, you might end up being knocked out of a district where you have, have um, lived. I, I once drew a plan, the plan I drew for Georgia actually drew lines so that one of the incumbents, actually a powerful incumbent in Georgia, was constitutionally ineligible to run because he had not lived in any of the districts for a year before the election, because he had moved at some point there. And so this is one of the ways in local and, and state redistrictings that those who hold the power sometimes will exact costs on, on their opponents. So they will end up drawing districts in a way to make someone um, unable to run from the district that they've represented up till then. Um, and so, you know, the, the, um, this is one of the more you know, ugly parts of redistricting. I mentioned before packing, cracking, and stacking. This is called kidnapping, right? Where you take a, an incumbent's residence and sort of kidnap them and take them out of their district and put them uh, in another district. And so um, the, the courts have not struck that down as illegal or unconstitutional. So if, if you try to go after incumbents by putting them into unfavorable districts, that's seen as within bounds. And that's something like under Rucho, the partisan gerrymandering case that seems pretty consistent with the hands-off uh, character of it. Um, but you know the, the the incumbency is often part of the big question, especially as as Laura mentioned in the chat. Um, the when you're dealing with congressional lines, um, um, because some states are going to lose districts, and so it's it's sort of like the game musical chairs, right? You keep taking away a chair, and then someone doesn't have a place to sit, and that you know means that either two people are sitting in the same chair, running from the same district, or they um, one of them bows out. Thank you. All right, two more questions and then we're gonna to have to wrap up. Um, one is about independent commissions. Um, we have Jack asking how gameable are, are independent commissions by parties? He's thinking about Virginia and California. I was struck in class when uh, Ben Ginsburg, who is on the line, shared his view that there's no such thing as an independent commission. That stuck with me. Um, what is your view on independent commissions? Are some more independent than others? Uh, are they gameable? What's what's the range? 
Well, you know, it's it's uh, this is a question about human psychology as much as political design, right? So the gameability of a commission depends on the people who are are occupying it, right? And so different different commissions have different motivations and personnel and the like. And I, the commissions I'm working for right now are very, very different from each other. Um, and so, as I said before, there are commissions, there are commissions. There, there, there are some commissions that are just like advisory and potentially toothless, but that, that put up uh, plans that then can be useful in either helping the legislature draw their lines or at least providing a benchmark against which you can shame the legislature by showing what would an actual nonpartisan plan look like. Um, and some commissions are genuinely nonpartisan or bipartisan just in the way they behave. But a lot of that, ha that's not about institutional design so much as it is the people who happen uh, to be on it. I tend to think that the California commission 10 years ago, and I was a critic of it, I should say, I was skeptical that they would be able to do their job, but I thought they did, they did a pretty good job in representing communities in California in a in a nonpartisan way. Republicans disagree with that and they see that commission as having been gained because that the Democrats allegedly went and um, did all these kind of community of interest arguments that swayed the commission to draw districts and you know that, that might have been biased in favor of the Democrats. The um, one of the things we, we noticed for example in Arizona, Arizona which was held out 20 years ago as this model redistricting commission, although the Democrats did sue thinking that they were got the short end of the stick, 10 years later, the commission ended up having its independent chair indict, or not indicted, uh, impeached by the state Senate, or by the state house, removed by the state Senate, and then reinstated by the state Supreme Court. But it was the same design, right? It was the same uh, law that was being applied there. It was just different people and different, and different oxes that were being gored, right? And so there's nothing about a commission that makes it nonpartisan, but you can try to put in kind of safeguards to insulate them from the political process and political pressures. Um, and in terms of gameability, right? Yes, many of them can be gamed. I don't think Virginia was gamed. I think that the Republicans and Democrats just couldn't agree. And so they blew it up. And we're seeing that around the country. Um, that these commissions, just like everything else in our politics, Democrats and Republicans can't agree with each other. I'm going to ask one more question uh, to, to, uh, as we depart. Litigation. Um, what you, you, you touched very briefly, but can you give us a, a more uh, in-depth sense of the scope of the litigation that we should expect this cycle in terms of you know, what kind of claims, what kind of quantity, how many states, how long will it last? Will it all be resolved by the midterms? What are we looking at here? Well, it's got to be resolved by, well, some, if it's going to be, if the districts are being challenged for the midterms, it's got to be resolved by then. But some redistricting litigation is going to go on for several years. It always does. I mean, I, when I was appointed to do the Pennsylvania redistricting or help the court with it, that happened in whatever, 2018 or so. Um, and so, you know, and, and that was a 2010 or 2011 redistricting plan. So redistricting law is the gift that keeps on giving throughout a 10 year cycle. Um, but the parties right now are, are rip roaring and ready to go. They will sue no matter wherever they feel that they got shafted. And so I mentioned the claims that, that are uh, available to them and redistricting law, like other kinds of litigation is throwing everything at the wall to see what sticks. And so there, there are very few angels when it comes to redistricting litigation. And so it's about, you know, thinking about to mix metaphors here, which arrows do you have in your quitter, quiver, right? The Voting Rights Act, if you think that there's a plausible claim that a minority community has been discriminated against. Um, one person, one vote, if uh, the, the, those who draw it screwed up. Shaw versus Reno claims, which I mentioned before, the, the over-concentration uh, or, or the preoccupation with race in the drawing of districts, if you feel that that's a way to strike down a redistricting plan, or any of these state law criteria like compactness, contiguity, respect for political subdivision lines, which are often not enforced, but I've been, like when I did the Maryland redistricting now 20 years ago, um, that was as a result of the incumbents, the, the state legislature splitting up too many counties, right? So it really depends on the on the locality, the, the jurisdiction, as to whether they are you know, vulnerable under different legal theories. But um, the parties are well-funded to litigate these cases. Um, election law is a burgeoning field, which is why any of you in, at Stanford should be taking my classes on this. Uh, and um, and they're, they're keyed in right now to start the loss. Some of the lawsuits have already been filed, but we should see an increasing pace of them in the next two to three months. Thank you, great. 
Well, thank you. I don't know whether, Lucy, uh, if you have concluding remarks here, but uh, everyone should join in. Go to drawcongress.org. If, you, if you're a Stanford student, please come in and uh, join us. Uh, this is a once in a decade, which for you might be a once in a lifetime opportunity. Yeah, thanks everybody for being here. And a special thanks to the Election Law Project, to the Levin Center, and of course to the Law and Policy Lab. Thank you both, Nate and Zahava. And I look forward to seeing more from drawcongress.org.